Today on Know the Truth from Philip de Courcy. It's been well said that if you look out at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within yourself, you'll be depressed. Look out, distressed. Look in, depressed. Look up, blessed. Did you notice the language? Blessed be God who blesses us with every spiritual blessing. Just think that through. James 1.17 says that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy encourages us to stop looking down at our failures and around at our circumstances and to look upward to where our help and blessings come from. It's an encouraging message titled Greatly Blessed from the Life Together series. And you can listen online at ktt.org and also find other helpful resources there. But right now, here's Pastor Philip. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 through 14. If you're joining with us this morning for the first time, we're in a series on the book of Ephesians called Life Together, a message I've called Greatly Blessed. So let's get blessed this morning by reading this blessing. Ephesians 1 verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. As we return to our study in the letter to the Ephesians, here Paul is breathless, thrilled, caught up in the rhapsody of soul concerning what the Christian has in having Jesus. Paul is in a rhapsody of soul. And by the way, Paul is locked up. When he writes this, Paul's in prison, right? Ephesians 6.20, he's an ambassador in chains. This is one of the prison epistles. We looked at that in the introduction a couple of weeks ago. But while he's locked up, he's locked onto the benefits and blessings he has in Jesus Christ. Paul is not feeling sorry for himself. One iota. He is humbled by the electing sovereign mercy of God. He's happy to be in Christ and all the benefits that accrue to him. And he's hopeful for future salvation. I hope you're not feeling sorry for yourself this morning. Not if you're a man in Christ. None of you are a woman in Christ. This should be a rhapsody of soul, given who he is and he's yours, given what he's done for you and promises to do out into eternity. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray and live rejoicing every day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. That's Paul. Now, before we go any further, these 12 verses form a doxology. This is a blessing. This is a eulogy, a thanksgiving before God. Paul begins his engagement and his encouragement to the Ephesians by blessing God for blessing him with every conceivable blessing. Did you notice the language? Blessed be God who blesses us with every spiritual blessing. Just think that through. Paul wants to bless God for blessing him with every conceivable blessing. Is that where you're at this morning? Are we in that frame of mind like David in Psalm 103, verses 1 to 5? Bless the Lord, O my soul. Is that the first thought that came to your mind this morning? When you turned around and moved to get out of bed, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. And let's not forget his benefits this day. 
He's forgiven me my sins. He has healed my diseases. He has redeemed my life from destruction. He has fed me with good things and he has renewed my strength. Here's another thing. Before Paul outlines the doctrine, he wants them to think about there's doxology. You've got doctrine and doxology and doxology and doctrine. One growing out of the other, the other producing the other. I love that. As Paul begins his outline of the doctrinal part of his epistle, he wants for himself, for them, and for us as readers, something more than a confession and a mental assent. He wants heartfelt, real-time joy in our discipleship, our evangelism, and our worship. Doctrine leads to doxology. I was at chapel some years ago at the Master's Seminary as a student then, and we had the visit, a wonderful day it was, when Dr. John Piper came to Master's Seminary. I remember the sermon. It was on exaltery preaching. Now, he knew our school was one of the premier schools on expository preaching, which was handed down to us from our president, Dr. John MacArthur. Exposit the text. Divide the scripture truly and rightly. And certainly Piper was on board with that, but he said, we've got to go one step further. God isn't just looking for expository preaching, but exaltory preaching. That as you expound the text, as you get into layer upon layer of understanding regarding the glory of the gospel, it should produce in you a song. It should produce in you a doxology. You should be a happy minister of Jesus Christ, a glad expositor of the Scriptures. There's two things I remember most about it. When he got around to talking about the Holy Spirit and he first mentioned the word Holy Spirit, he got down under the pulpit and then he came back up. And he said, am I allowed to mention the Holy Spirit at the Master's Seminary? But the other statement was this. In the middle of his sermon, making the point about exaltry preaching, he pointed his finger. He was on a roll and he pointed to us all. If you don't sing in your sermon, get out of the ministry. Now, whoever was sleeping was woke up by this point. And what a memorable statement. If you don't sing in your sermon, get out of the ministry. Paul is singing in his sermon here to the Ephesians. He can hardly catch a breath. He's so excited to be a recipient of God's gracious dealings with him in Jesus Christ. Let's be happy Christians. Let's be those who thrill at the sound of Jesus' name, at the retelling of the gospel, as understanding all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Let's repent of our yawning. Let's repent of the thought that I've heard this before. May it not be water off a duck's back, so to speak. Let's thrill. Let there be a rhapsody of soul among us here at Kindred about the gospel. So as we begin to look at these verses and work the way through, I'm just going to stick with verse 3 for today. And unpack this wonderful opening verse, which constitutes the headwaters of this great waterfall of cascading truth. There's three things we're going to look at. The source of these blessings, the sphere of these blessings, and the scope of these blessings. Look, if you look out, as we said, to stress. If you look in, to press. Let's look up where Christ is seated. And let's be blessed. Let's look at the source. Verse 3, blessed, here's the source, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father is the benefactor. We are the beneficiary. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. 
the God who is worthy of our blessing has blessed us with every conceivable blessing. And you'll notice these words, has, who has blessed us. These possessions are ours. All of these benefits in Jesus Christ are ours. If you go back to the book of Joshua, God gave Israel the land of Canaan. It was theirs. It was their possession. But they had to go and possess the possession. And you and I can grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what? Right now, we possess all the spiritual blessings necessary to live the Christian life. We'll come back to that. That's your status. That's your state. And it's a ground for rejoicing. Our Father God has deliberately blessed us by choosing us, predestining us, adopting us, accepting us, forgiving us, and guaranteeing within us through the presence of the Holy Spirit the hope of heaven. Wouldn't you say he has been lavish in his love? Therefore, let's be lavish in our praise. Darrell Johnson has got an excellent commentary on the book of Ephesians. Let me quote him here and paraphrase a little bit as I go along, but we want to focus a bit on this word bless. He said this, bless involves the hands and the knees. The Greek word is the word from which we get eulogy, thanksgiving. It translates the Hebrew barak, a word involving the posture of kneeling. To bless is to bring a gift to another while kneeling, while kneeling out of respect. To bless means to come before another, to get down on your knees, stretch out one's hands, and offer a gift. To bless God, therefore, means to come before His presence, kneel in adoration and submission, lift up your hands and offer a gift. Give Him all that you are, give Him all that you have. Time, treasure, talents. And we're told to do that, blessed be the God, or blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go before him and offer ourselves, our family, our business, our time, our money, our talents to him. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't that marvelous? I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what's occupied you, but this better start occupying what you think about And what you focus on, that God so loved you and me and the world that he gave his only begotten son, that the God of all the universe who made heaven and earth was made flesh and dwelt among us and was made sin, that we might be made righteous before him? Is there anything more glorious? Is there a thought in the world of math and science and medicine more glorious than that? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us. God humbled himself, and Christ became obedient to the death of the cross. Amazing, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And when we have been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. The source of these blessings, the sphere of these blessings. Now, there's several spheres. There's different layers to this. Look at the text. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. That's the source. Here's the sphere. With every spiritual blessings in, that's the location in the heavenly places, in, that's the location, sphere, in Christ. Let's unpack that. First and foremost, these gifts and displays of God's goodness and grace are ours in, through, with, by union with Jesus Christ. See, when you and I put our faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit brings us into vital union with Christ, right? The bride to the bridegroom, the branch to the vine. You get the analogies we looked at a few weeks ago. So by faith, we have union with Christ. And our union with Christ is the outcome of the Father's will who chose us to that end. And the Spirit's work who brought that about in real time through an effectual calling. 
And you know what? All that Jesus Christ is and all that he has accomplished as prophet, priest, and king, it's ours in Christ. The fruits of his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, enthronement, and promised return, ours to enjoy. Because we're in union with him. Where he is, we are representatively there. What he has achieved is ours by heritage. John MacArthur's right. Christ's riches are our riches. His righteousness is our righteousness. His resources are our resources. It's through Christ. It's in Christ, in union with him, that we access these gifts and benefits. Look at verse 3. In Christ, we have spiritual blessings. Look at verse 4. He chose us in him. Look at verse 7. In him, we have redemption through his blood. Look at verse 11. In him, we also have obtained an inheritance. That's what we have in union with Jesus Christ. You need to start counting your spiritual pennies, my friend, and all that you have in the Savior. And by the way, here's a wonderful thought. It's not a question of how long you're in Christ. It doesn't matter whether you're a year in Christ. I met a young man at breakfast just a few months in Christ yesterday. It doesn't matter whether you're a year in Christ or 50 years in Christ. It doesn't matter how deep you're in Christ, whether you're paddling or you're submerged. These are your blessings, young or old, mature or immature. We might only give ourselves one out of 10 for evangelism, two out of 10 for prayer, three out of 10 for holiness, but it doesn't matter. Well, it does I want you to get beyond that. But you know what I mean? It doesn't matter in terms of these blessings are still yours. All you have to be is in Christ. Not an issue of time or depth. In Christ, in union with Christ, all of these are yours. Presently, entirely, irrevocably. Philip Graham Ryken says this marvelously. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Just as we were utterly lost in Adam through the imputation of his sin, so we are completely saved in Christ through the gift of his salvation. It is in covenant with Christ that we are predestined, redeemed, forgiven, adopted, reconciled, sanctified, and glorified. Christ is not only the beginning and the end of our salvation, he is our salvation, for in him we receive everything we need to be saved. The location of our salvation is Jesus Christ. Here's an analogy. I stole this from one of the writers I've been studying this week. He says this, if we have a friend who owns an exciting sports car, although we can admire it from a distance, we can only enjoy it when we are racing along the motorway in the car with them. Now, I'm in a conversation right now with a guy in the church who has a car I want to drive. It's a Dodge Challenger Hellcat. All right? It's got 800 horsepower. Now, I'm admiring it right now from a distance. We're working on a calendar to get my time in the car. I'm admiring it right now from the outside looking in. But I want to get on the inside. I want to smell the leather, and I want to burn some rubber. Legally, I think. My friend, when it's one thing to admire Christ in the gospel. And some of you are here admiring it, and I respect that. There's some element of God-fearing reality in your life, but you've got to get in on the inside. You've got to know Christ and taste Christ. And when you're in the inside, when you're in union with him, this is all yours. This is all ours. As we head down the highway of discipleship. Secondly, you'll notice that these are spiritual blessings. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I think these are spiritual in contrast to material. Not that God is not interested in the material welfare and well-being of his people. He has given us all things to enjoy. 1 Timothy 6, verse 17. But this is a focus on salvation, one's soul's wellness and well-being, and I think the word spiritual is best understood as things pertaining to and things belonging to the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, maybe a way to understand it is spirit blessings. Spirit blessings. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with spirit blessings. See, the plan and the provision of God in Christ is made real to us through the agency and activity of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that regenerates. He's the one that brings us to faith in Jesus Christ and convinces us of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. He's the one that baptizes us into the body of Christ. He's the one that then takes up residence in our life and dwells us. And according to Ephesians 1, 13 to 14, seals us as the guarantee that God's going to completely save us. You can't lose your salvation. He gifts us with enablements to serve the body. He wrote the Bible, by the way, and therefore when you read it, he'll have a conversation with you about understanding it. It's called illumination. He empowers us. I think you get the point. As one writer says, the Holy Spirit is the warden of God's treasure house of blessings. And that's, by the way, why you better be walking in the Spirit and not fulfilling the flesh Galatians 5. That's, by the way, why you need to be filled with the Spirit and not be drunk with wine. Ephesians 5 verse 18. And that's why you must not grieve him and hurt him by a lifestyle opposed to his will. Ephesians 4, 30 to 32. These blessings are fundamentally spiritual, not material, sacred, not secular, timeless, not temporary. Robert Kramacki says this, in that culture, enormous wealth was centered in Ephesus and it became known as the Bank of Asia. All believers in contrast have been made rich in Christ. Isn't that what Paul says here in Ephesians 1 verse 7? In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Are you counting your spiritual pennies? Stop looking at your bank balance. Stop feeling poor about yourself and your circumstances. You're in Christ, my friend, and you're rich. And God has blessings that stretch out into an endless future for you. A wonderful reminder of the spiritual wealth we have in Christ. You're listening to Philip DeCourcy on Know the Truth in the first part of a new message titled, Greatly Blessed. You can hear and share more messages from the Life Together series by visiting us online at ktt.org. At Know the Truth, it's our mission to proclaim God's truth so that men and women can live in the freedom that Christ provides. Whether the topic is unity, wisdom, or warfare, Philip DeCourcy shares biblical truth to equip you to live a life that honors God and builds up you and your family. And this month, Philip wants to share a book with you that highlights an important issue for men, women, and families. It's called The War on Men, Why Society Hates Them and Why We Need Them. There's a war against men in our culture, but what will happen without men of courage and conviction? Who will do the hard jobs that no one else can do? Who will be left to face down evil, strengthen families, build churches, and bolster communities? Author Owen Strawn addresses those questions in this compelling new book, The War on Men. It's an inspiring blend of cultural analysis, biblical teaching, and passionate exhortation, and it makes a timely and significant resource. You can request your copy when you give a gift of any amount to know the truth. Just call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. And if you're new to Know the Truth, ask for this month's free resource, a refreshing devotional by Pastor Philip titled, Resting in God's Faithfulness. Well, I'm Wayne Shepherd. Come back tomorrow for another insightful and encouraging lesson on what it means to be greatly blessed. That's Thursday on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.